What is the relationship between the material and the immaterial worlds, the world of everything we experience, including our experience of the material world through our senses, through our consciousness, through our awareness, through our thoughts about the world, and the actual physical world itself, you know, whatever that may be, which we only experience through the consciousness, but there's this idea of those two aspects of, of the universe, of what we experience. That there it seems to be this material substance that science says when we look into it, it's mostly space, just like when we look out in space, there's mostly space, and then there's a planet or a star, but it's mostly space in between. The galaxies, mostly space in between the galaxies. Between the galactic clusters and superclusters, there's these vast spaces that, that dwarf all of the space that has matter in it. So uh, on every scale, large and small, we see that when we analyze what's, what is, it's mostly space. But those, that space isn't empty space. The old original I idea, the term vacuum, like the, is the idea that when we take all the matter out of space that there's nothing left. A vacuum is an emptiness. But in fact, we find that that emptiness is actually a fullness, a plenum rather than a vacuum would be the, the proper correction of the terminology. So it's a fullness, but, but what kind of fullness? It's a fullness of energy. There's, there's as much energy inside every proton as there is uh, enough, as many units of the fundamental units of, of energy, the smallest, the, called the Planck unit in physics, the smallest unit that, that we can identify. There's as many units of Planck energy inside each, each proton of matter, the fundamental particle of matter, matter as there are protons in the, in the universe. As far as we can calculate, it's, it's a precise relationship. Uh, so what, is, what are you saying? So what I'm saying is within matter, if we took the matter away, there's still as much energy in that space as there is matter in the universe on a, a fractal level. There's like a representation, an energetic representation of everything in each one, just as there is in our cells. Each of our cells has all of the DNA that codes for every part of our body. So if you take this much matter and remove it, then this much space contains the same amount of protons as if the matter were there? Is no, that the, what you're the saying? Space, space wouldn't contain protons. You've taken the protons away. Okay, but so even the space inside one of those protons has as many Planck units as there are protons of matter in the entire universe that we can see, the, the, the Hubble sphere, the visible universe. So you're saying that a Planck is this, uh, that the, re the ratio of Planck's in a teeny tiny fractal is equivalent to the number of proteins in protons. the proton, oh, yeah, protons, uh, protons in the larger amount of space. Is that what you, you're saying? A, a Planck equals a proton? In, in a sense, kind yes. Kind of in the micro, There's, macro yes, scale? Yes, yes, that there, that there could be, that we theorize in the clinical theory of everything, that it's not, the universe, as Einstein said, God doesn't play dice with the universe, or we can say that, that the universe is not random. Nothing in the universe is random, even at that scale of the Planck or the scale of the, the, the field of, of an electron, where uh, the, the current accepted view, the, the, the mainstream view, is that there's a probability field. Well, what is a probability? A probability simply means that we don't have the means to measure exactly where that electron is and, and at the same time measure where it's going or how fast it's moving and what direction. We can measure one or the other. It's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We, we can't know both. But both are precise and real and exact, not a probability. Yeah. And how does this relate to the body healing? So our body is the same. The body is part of this universe. It's made of, of this substance, whatever that substance is. 
So if the substance of our body, the protons of, of our body that make up the minerals of our body, that's the fundamental material substance, if, those, if each one of those is fractally connected to the entire universe, not separate from it, but intimately actually containing it in a sense, containing the information, containing the relationship, the knowledge of the entire universe in every atom, in every proton, then we're not just... Uh, uh, the idea of the body as a separate dead mechanical machine made of dead minerals is not at all accurate. In fact, there's evidence that one mineral can change to another in, in the living system. Uh, this is called biological transmutation of elements. So, so what are these elements? What, are, what is matter? It's, it's actually, it is energy. We know from E equals MC squared, there's an equivalence of energy and matter, that, that matter is better understood, better visualized as, as a foam, as a bubbles of foam riding atop this sea of energy, sea of universal energy. And so that plenum, that fullness of energy that's inside the matter that makes us up is not a different energy in one atom and another atom. It's the same energy. It's in a different place. It's in every place. And so what does that have to do with the body? It means that we have no idea what's not possible for the body to do when the body is in a living state, when it's connected to that universal energy, that field of, that probability field, or that it's really a possibility field. It's a field of potential, electrical potential. Magnetic field is an energy potential, potential for movement, for acceleration, for change. And, and because the, the consciousness is part of that field, it's, it's the guiding and directing energy of life that allows us to change with intention, to change with, with uh, uh, directedness and guidance. And, and that's what life is. Life is fundamentally a, uh, a process of what we should call syntropy, which is the, the, the flip side of entropy. In science, we can measure entropy. It's, it's well, it's well uh, understood, in a sense, except it's not well understood what drives it. It's just that, oh, entropy exists. In other words, if you have heat, you have a, hot, a cup of hot water here, it's going to cool down. That energy dissipates. That's but what if, entropy th is? That's what entropy dissipation? is, dissipation right. of energy. But it's dissipation of energy that's not coherent. It's energy that's random from our scale, looking at it. We look into the water and we say, oh, there's, part of, there's water particles that are, some are hotter than others. The, the heat would be a, like a random, they call Brownian motion of the atoms. This motion that's just b banging into one thing, banging into another. Not, not a unified energy, which would be syntropy. A living state, you, you take a seed and you place it on the ground and it sprouts and it grows into a tree. That's syntropy. It's, it, the tree is a or, self-organizing entity, just as a galaxy is a self-organizing entity, or just as a proton is a self-organizing entity. And it's self-organizing and stable in space-time, and therefore we experience it as material. What we call material is simply those energy forms which are stable in space and time. If something appears and disappears, well, that's, not, that's not a property of matter. It's not stable in, in, in time. It's here and it's not here. But there are types of matter now documented that do that, and that's called condensates. Bose-Einstein condensates, or the patent work on, on orms, uh, orbitally rearranged monatomic elements was the original term, uh, now called ormus, by, by many modern alchemists who work with that process of the consciousness being able to direct the evolution, the change of material substance. And that becomes a co-evolution because the substrate of consciousness is this other state of matter that has the properties that we see in all matter at a quantum state, at a quantum level, when we look at a single single atom, a single electron, a single proton, 
it has qualities of consciousness and of spirit. It, it, the, the, the more we probe into it, the deeper and the finer we pro probe into it, the more it reveals the underlying nature of everything, including material substance, as being the nature of consciousness, which can move at the speed of thought. It can bilocate in two places at one time. It can appear and disappear. Uh, it, it, these are all qualities of the quantum world, the strangeness of the quantum world that, that physicists talk about. Hmm. is the same strangeness that we see in the spirit world and in the world of thought and consciousness. Okay, so are you saying that um, our consciousness is what unifies us as a, an entity of matter, and that if, we, if our consciousness is not coherent, then our body is not going to be coherent, and that's like disease? I'd modify that slightly. Our consciousness has the potential to either be supportive in our coherence or to be divisive. Our consciousness can, can destroy us. It can divide us. We can, we can suppress an emotion and divide ourselves physiologically. If I suppress anger, I'm dividing the biocommunication between my liver and the rest of my body. I'm, I'm separating. I'm damaging. I'm just, it's a dis destructive or, or force of breaking apart, separating. And we can also use the consciousness to increase coherence, to break through that suppression, to send my awareness to my liver, to the, the feeling of anger, to uh, memories of experiences of anger. And, and I can, by sending, when we send consciousness intentionally to something, it has a fundam its fundamental nature is union. So the way consciousness can divide is by creating ideas of separation, polarity, separation, uh, or by simply, uh, or part of that, that leads to ultimately to then suppression, which is just a lack of consciousness in a certain area, or we could even call it a different type of consciousness. If I suppress anger, it doesn't mean there is no anger. It doesn't mean that there's no anger on any level of consciousness. It means it's not on a level of consciousness of organismic level, my, as, a, as a whole, as a person, I'm not aware of my anger. But you as a person might look at me and my behavior and my expression and how I move, how the, and, and we might look at the, tone, the, the frequencies in my voice and find, oh yeah, there's anger there. So, so it's, a, it's, it's my spirit living in a smaller world. It's a contraction of the spirit. It's because really, our, ultimately, our spirit is universal. There is no point where the consciousness, the, the mind, the spirit ends. There's, there's, there are shells, like in an atom, there's, there's electron orbital shells, and an electron that receives light energizes into a higher orbital. It can even ionize. But, so it can ionize and it can move out to the infinite ends of the universe, and it's still the same electron. We're still the same person. There's a continuity of identity in the universe that's how that works on not only on our level but on the level of material substance. So if we take if we make a medicine, for example, we can make vitamin C. How do we make vitamin C? Well, we can take sugar cane and refine it into pure sugar that has you know traces of nickel and things that are used in the processing, and and also carries the, the memory, the energy of that processing. And we take that and we synthetically change it into ascorbic acid and, and it's, so it's vitamin C. And the conventional view is it's pure vitamin C. You know, oh, okay, maybe we can measure a trace of, of this. That it's an insignificant amount on a material level. It's not toxic. No worries. It's 99.99% pure. It's vitamin C. Same exact thing as if we take vitamin C from uh, a, from a plant that produces vitamin C, and maybe refine that, or we have it maybe in the whole plant extract. It has other things, but from a from a conventional point of view, just how many milligrams of vitamin C is all that matters. But in fact, the body will respond differently to those different sources, even if it's purified from two sources to the same level of purity. Even if it was 
theoretically 100% pure, it's still energetically different. It has a different history. It has, matter has memory. And this was shown with water. Uh, and then there was a huge uproar when that was, when the research was published in, in I think in Nature and in a major scientific journal. And, and, and there's, there's still, you know, it's been suppressed. That information has been suppressed. Even though there's been follow-up research and continues to be follow-up research by other, this was a Nobel Prize winning scientist who, who did the study. How does this relate to what you were talking about earlier about uh, matter is, space is most of everything, and there's these little bits of matter in right. between so space. So what is, what is space? What, it's a huge question, huge unanswered question. What is space? What is time? Are they, are they dimensions? Are they, uh, uh, are they uh, some sort of uh, etheric presence of something, like the Planck units of energy, time, and, and matter, and, and space? The Planck is a universal unit. It covers all of those dimensions. Uh, so I look at, at the old concept and it's still a new concept of the ether, of, of what is it that, about space that allows it to carry electromagnetic waves? And the, the modern concept is nothing. It's just, there's just the wave. It's just the mathematics, as if the, the model is the thing, that we have a mathematical form that describes the behavior and therefore, there doesn't need to be any medium for the wave to travel through to carry the wave. Every other wave form, every wave form, has is a wave of something, of some medium, some carrier of that wave. And so the 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 etheric model would say that that we would say that that, that Planck unit is is a fundamental level of of uh, energetic identity that can, has the capacity to care, not only to carry electromagnetism, but to carry every other form of communi communication. And, and how can that be? The, we know that there are other forms of, of communication besides electromagnetism, which travels at the speed of light. There is... So what, was, what is the answer to the question that you just brought up? What is space? That's what I'm... <laughs> working toward well, well it, it's, a, it's a big question it's, it's, just, it's not a simple I question can't follow you. Right? it's not a simple question what do you think what is space is it nothingness or is it something or is it just a measure is it is it, it is a, a dimension right there's three dimensions of space three three different three orthogonal we call it in math three directions at right angles to each other. So there's left, right, forward, and back biologically, and up, down. We've got a gravitational dimension. We've got a dimension of, of symmetry, and relative symmetry in the body. And we've got a, a direction of, of, uh, of movement, of, of transaction and interaction. You know, so, so they're fundamentally different in function, those three directions. Well, we have the same thing in, in physics, what do we have that has three orthogonal directions in physics is electromagnetism, which is the, the fundamental energy uh, form that we can observe and measure. But again, there's, there's a couple of other forms that are more subtle that we need to bring in to the picture to understand the big picture. But it, it, in, in, uh, in physics, in electromagnetism, if we have motion, well, that's like our forward and back direction. You have, say, an electron or a proton that's moving through space, whatever that space is, which we'll need to, we're trying to get to, among other things, to understand what we are. Because if we're made of mostly space, and the stuff that we think is material is actually just energy that has coherence over time, in time and space, and we're creating this form, this body, that has relative amount of coherence or can gain or lose coherence, can gain syntropy, which is the fundamental power of life to self-organize, or entropy, which is the fundamental uh, nature of material substance to dissipate. You know, we have entropy when we die, the body falls apart, it, it decays. When we have disease, that's entropy. That so these things are all going on at all the time yes. in different places yes. in the body. There's waves as well. 
when we heal, we don't heal in a straight line, we heal in waves. The body will, we, we need, we can't live, syntropy can't exist without entropy. They're, they're fundamental, fundamentally linked processes, like in the body, we see it in terms of, of anabolism, when the body builds up, we, we grow from one cell to 90 trillion cells. Well, that's, that's the metabolic function of, of growth and development, of making two cells from one. But in that process, we can't do that without also being able to break down, say, a cell that dies. Cells die. If a cell dies, we need to be able to break that down and clean out that space in order to make space for a new cell to form. When we can't, we, have, we can have something like cancer, where the cells just keep multiplying and they don't break down, they don't die, because the fundamental nature of life is syntropic, is, is generative, is growth. Just like matter in the universe, we see stars, we see galaxies, and they, they grow out of this space, out of pure space, which is not nothingness, but fullness, fullness of potential, of possibility, of energy. It can self-organize into these higher, higher, in a sense, higher forms. In a sense, space itself is the highest form. It's, it's universal. It's because the space that's inside you is not separate from the space that's inside me. By our nature of being individual, just like one electron is individual from another or one proton is individual from another, it's that individuality that, that does create the space. That creates, it's a relationship. If we were in an entirely different space, there'd be no relationship. We'd be in a different universe. You wouldn't exist for me if you were not in relationship in space and time. And how we experience that through the senses is from the past, from this electromagnetic power of matter and, and, to, to, and of space to move the waveforms. So light reflects off your skin from the lights and comes into my eyes and travels, it triggers an electromagnetic wave into the brain, triggers electromagnetic fields in my visual cortex. And that's still not enough to explain how I see you. How does, does the visual cortex see you? Or is there something when I'm having an in-body experience, I would call it, when I, my spirit, my consciousness is, is present, you know, if I'm asleep, I'm not seeing you, if my eyes are, even if my eyes are open, if I'm in a coma, I'm not seeing you, if my brain, if my heart is functioning but my brain is flatlined, if I'm brain dead, I'm not seeing you. There, uh, a person in, I think it was World War II, where their optic nerves got shot through, but they survived. The eyes were perfectly healthy, and so was the visual cortex, but they couldn't see. Uh, so, so when we're in the body, we're experiencing through electromagnetism, light, through sound waves, which are a, a, a a pressure wave in the matter, but that ultimately is transferred from one piece of matter, one air molecule to the next through the electromagnetic interactions between those molecules. Even within the molecules, they're held together by electromagnetism, which is uh, forms that are now understood to be part of electromagnetism called the weak and the strong force that hold together the, the, the molecule, the atom, and, and the strong force in the nucleus. So those are all electromagnetism. And then there's one more force that we can measure that's called gravity that we don't yet know how that works. There's various theories and various possibilities. The most likely of which is, I believe, and in our theory, that it's a form of another form of electromagnetism that has to do with the, the uh, electrical charge difference between the proton and the electron and how the presence of other matter and its electromagnetic field interacts with that. For example, if we were to change the number of electrons in your body without, without adding more protons or subtracting protons, if we add or subtract electrons, if we change your electrical charge, we know that the Earth is electrically charged, we could actually levitate your body with an electric field. with a very small percentage of change. And we, in fact, have no way of measuring 
how many electrons are in your body. We can measure electrical fields with a wire. We can measure the difference, the voltage, but we have no way to measure, for example, the electric field between the Earth and the Sun. We only know that the Earth is negatively charged. We can hypothesize, we do hypothesize that the Sun is positively charged, and so there's an electric field. One of the best proofs of the power of that field is that what's called conventionally the solar wind, when particles come off the sun into space, right, going against gravity. These are protons, for Can example. Can I just ask you a question? Who Sorry. are you talking to? <laughs> really? I can't understand, can't understand. you. No. I'm hearing okay. all these words. I have these concepts. I don't feel related in my body to anything that you're saying. At the odd time you say something, I go, yeah, okay, good. That's something. Now, how does it relate to everything else you're saying? And I don't feel related. I don't, I don't mean to interrupt your flow, but I don't know where this flow is going to be useful. So what is the question that you're stuck at? How this relates to anything that you do, anything that somebody does, how is this how can you make this more practical for people? Like you know, it's like if, if I want to find if I have cancer, I want to find out what I should do about cancer, I don't know how my consciousness being measured and what is space, how that's gonna help me. And most people are so, like not really looking for what you're saying, they're looking for what do I do about my problem? So what is cancer? What do we believe <coughs> cancer is? What is it that we're treating? If, I'm treat if I have a tumor, if I have a cancer, which we all have cancer cells in our body, what... Or just somebody, an athlete, what is, want, an athlete wanting to be oh, But it's a good question. Enhanced, it's, it's, you know? Okay, and that's a different question, but, but ultimately the answers are, to me, in our model, are the, are the same. How we treat ourselves in order to improve health and performance... And, and personal growth is all in alignment because that's the syntropic direction of healing, personal growth, positive development. So this syntropic mm -hmm. word is a brand new word to me and I didn't even know it existed. Right. I don't know entropy. what it means still. Do you know entropy? In Not physics? really. Okay. You said that's about breaking up. Or yeah, dissolving. The, it's one of the, the one of the fundamental quote laws of physics is that entropy increases. The one of the laws of physics right. is that entropy increases. Right. In other words, what you were just saying about galaxies growing bigger is that entropy? No, that's no. that's okay. entropy. See, so so the right. So the conventional view is we can measure entropy. We know it, we can measure it increasing, the randomness. We can measure randomness increasing. We can measure things dissipating. We can't measure in the same way things growing, things you know, holding, together. holding together and, and growing. We know that they do, and, and from an entropy point of view, we can we can justify that, say, you know, the, the human body grows in, you know, from one cell to many, and it is growing like a crystal in structure. It's growing in, in organization. It's like a crystal. Uh, it is an organized thing. And from the conventional view, there's enough, there's enough increase in randomness in the environment, like heat right, is the sort of the, the best the, the major view of entropy in, in science. So you're, you're giving off heat. So you're growing, but you're giving off heat. You eat food, you use some of it to grow your structure, and there's way, this idea of the waste heat that's given off that accounts for, you know, you're using some of that energy, there's a certain efficiency. If you have 100 calories, maybe you burn 90 calories as, as just given off as heat and motion, and you know, you're moving around, you're burning energy, you're using it in motion and heat, and maybe, maybe 10 calories of that goes into structure, into building a new cell, right? I have a question about entropy and entropy. 
Yeah, yeah, please. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if when you inhale, it's syntropy, and when you exhale, it's entropy. Because when we breathe out, you can feel heat. When you breathe in through your nose, you can feel cold. When you breathe in, things kind of like come together. And when you breathe out, things will theoretically dissipate or could. The oxygen the, or the, the air that you're breathing. Mm -hmm. And also just like on a even emotional, spiritual, mental level, you breathe in clarity, for example, or peace or something. Yeah, you're taking in. And then you let go of disillusionment or whatever, you know, negativity, if you will. Does that resonate as a possibility? Yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a valid perspective. It's, uh, so we could also, so yes. And it's not an absolute. It's not, okay, that's, it's only, en only entropy happening when I'm exhaling. But yeah, that's, uh, you're looking at relationships, and that's, that's how I come at this clinical theory, trying to see those relationships, because they can give us insights of how to heal better. There's a lot we don't know. And, and even starting there, even realizing, even accepting that there's so much we don't know is, to me, a huge freedom in terms of healing. If we think... Oh, well, science knows everything, and my doctor has studied that, so he knows everything. I don't know anything, and, and, and the senses are, are, aren't valid. I can't trust my senses, which is a modern view, which flies in the face of the other modern view of, of evolution that, that we've developed genetically for survival. It's like, no, our senses, are, if they've developed for survival, they've developed for survival, and we should trust them because that's what <laughs> is here to help us survive. So, so there's contradictions, major contradictions within scientific conventional views. Just, we have to step outside the box to see them. Within the box, we can't see them. It's like, well, of course, you know, we can't trust our senses. We've got to use technology to measure things and, and trust, the, trust those measurements, even though those measurements, looking at the universe, tell us we can only measure a little bit, about 4% of the universe, <laughs> and the other, most of it, we've have no clue what it is, or we have ideas, but we can't find it. Dark energy, dark matter, what is that? So like, like consciousness and spirit, well, what is that? It's dark to science, it's, it's dark energy, it's dark matter. The spirit, the, the spirit body, the ghost in the machine, the conscious body that's super fluid, that can move in and out of the body, is rejected even as a possibility by, in, in conventional science, doesn't exist. There is no immortality, there is no free will, there is no real consciousness, it's a fake consciousness, it's illusion. So then, but then our consciousness that's observing the machine taking a measurement of the things we can measure that's more materially based and energetically based is illusory, equally illusory, but, uh, but we trust that. It's still our own consciousness that, that we're trusting, but only mediated by some machine consciousness what a machine can be aware of. Uh, that was a bit of a tangent. So <laughs> what <laughs> I meant to... Is there anything else? <laughs> what, I, what I meant to, uh, to... to just talk about a little bit is, is the breath. Breath is a, a really great place to look at the relationship of consciousness and physiology. There's a, an actual coherent... Uh, breath cycle at, at 10 seconds or 0.1 hertz I mean the same thing so if, if I inhale for 5 seconds and exhale for 5 seconds so the complete breath cycle inhale and exhale it takes 10 seconds or even close to that if it's 9 seconds or 11 seconds if I do that consciously for a few cycles my body will, my body, mind, spirit complex, because I'm conscious. If I'm dead, we can talk about the body alone without talking about consciousness and spirit. If we're asleep, we can talk about a different state of consciousness. If, if we're having an out of body experience or a near death experience, we can talk about the body and the consciousness, but they have a different location in space. So uh, that breath cycle, we go into a state of coherence, which is a sign 
in, 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 as I interpret, as we look at in our model, a state of coherence is a sign that there's syntropy happening, that there's, there's coherence. Coherence is one, is, is one of the fundamental ways that we can measure the presence of a self-organizing principle of syntropy, which we see in life, we see in the cosmos. Wait a second. Coherence is what? Uh, to me, it's an absolute sign of syntropy, of, of universal consciousness, fractal consciousness at some level, which is, I define consciousness as a an energetic resonance that transcends some dimension of space-time. Could transcend a dimension of space, a, tr a dimension of time, or both. So, uh, I might think that I am coherent in my consciousness. Mm -hmm. How would a person know that? That, they're co that something is if coherent? they're coherent. Okay, if they, that, saying that there's one element, one, one measure of coherence for the person as a whole, and we could say, okay, let's, let's see, what would that measure be? How coherent are you? But we'd have to look at every aspect of coherence and bring them all into that one definition. What is, I, I don't know what that one definition of co coherence would be other than we could say that uh, the, 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 the most powerful definition of coherence perhaps would be your saintliness. If a, if a person is a living saint, they are in a state of high coherence. And things, quantum level, quantum type effects, non-local effects, effects that, that are, that are, uh, that increase coherence in the space, in, in the universe, in the space around them or space time that's somehow connected even through thought with them there's an increase in syntropy, increase in, in health, increase in consciousness, increase in life. So when, when, when a body comes back to life from the dead, that's a, that's a restoration, that's an increase, a localized, in space-time, localized increase in the coherence and the syntropy in that body space. And it's, and it's a, a discon, there's a discontinuity there's a quantum change, but on a macroscopic level of the size of a body. If, if a person has no eye, lost their eye, uh, and decades later, they miraculously regain that eye. It's instantaneous. Because they were a saint? Because this historically happened not to a saint, but connected to a saint. It was a miracle associated with a saint. The saint so, prayed for the person's eye? I'd have to look at that particular instance and see whether, but, but in general, it could, be, it could even be a third person invoking that saint, praying for the person to be healed. It could be the person thinking of that saint and receiving that healing. So, yeah, it's not necessarily that the, the person receiving healing is saintly. I mean, Christ healed people from all kinds who were sinners.